I'm Sean Douglas, an actor and director in Chicago, Illinois, and also a member of the theater department faculty at Northwestern University. And this is An Actor's Arc. Michael Patrick Thornton is a dynamic actor both on the screen and on the stage. He is also an improviser, a director, and the artistic director of the Chicago theater company he co-founded, The Gift. Hello, Michael Patrick Thornton. Welcome to An Actor's Arc. No, oh, thank you for having me. Honored. When was the first inkling that you had that um, acting was a thing, uh, that it was something you were interested in? I remember um, being bussed into Steppenwolf to see a production of, uh, it was called 12 Angry Jurors. So, you know, mixed gender uh, cast directed mm -hmm. by Bob Bruler. I was probably in sixth grade. And, uh, you know, besides like one musical at Disney World or something when I was a kid, it was the first play that I had ever seen. And I remember being in the balcony, like, you know, white knuckling it, you know, looking at 10 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and it just seemed extraordinary to me that, that this was happening right now. I mean, coming from the Northwest side of Chicago, Jefferson Park, there's no, there was no professional theater out here whatsoever. And uh, it was, so it was those early experiences. We, we were brought to, before Shakespeare Rep was Chicago Shakespeare, um, before Chicago Shakespeare was Chakaga Shakespeare, there's Shakespeare Rep. And uh, they were at the Ruth Page Theater. And we saw a production of Twelfth Night. And again, you know, 10 in the morning and Twelfth Night, you know, starts, of course, if music be the food of love, play on. So, um, the lights come up and the actor goes, um, if food, y'all fuck, lights down. <laughs> and I was like, what just happened? You know, that was my first experience with Shakespeare, you know? It was about a 30 second pause in the black and everyone's just pandemonium. Lights come, <laughs> lights come back up and he goes, if music. And uh, <laughs> so I guess the idea that something that seemed, you know, fake, like, oh, we're gonna go see a play, but that that there were real things happening. There were accidents that happened and that were incorporated. And uh, it was just was just mind blowing. And then, you know, I set it aside for a while. I went to, I wore my Iowa shirt for tonight, but I went to Iowa to be a writer. I thought, you know, I'll write plays and novels in the summer and I'll teach English. And I had a teacher, Mike Peterson, who was a real formidable, influence on me, Carol Van Dermy, both instilled a love of Shakespeare and, and the written word. And, um, and then, you know, we needed a little more money to go to college. So I auditioned for their theater scholarship, got it. So by virtue of getting it, had to change my major or double major. And uh, what, you know, used to be my muse writing switched to becoming my mistress. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there you have it. So when you auditioned for that um, uh, grant or fellowship, did yeah. um, were you already acting? Yes, I mean, yes, yes, I was. I mean, we had started a theater company in high school called the Graveyard Players, uh, two of whom are now members of the Gift. So these are people I've known since like you know ninety three, and. Um, and let me just yeah. say the Gift Theater is a, a, a theater in Jefferson Park, a neighborhood in Chicago, which you are co-artistic director of, is that right? Artistic or, director, co -founder. Artistic director, thank you. Yeah, um, 20 year anniversary coming up in December. Um, wow. And then, so the co this ties back to Iowa. It was the first time in the history of the theater program, they were having trouble deciding, you know, to whom to give this fellowship. And so they found extra dough and they gave it to two people. And the two people that they gave it to, myself and William Nedved, were the two people who started the gift. Um, so oh, it's kind of wow. wild. And so, yeah, I mean, I, um, and then I lied about my age as a senior in high school to take a class at Victory Gardens with Fred Stone, who became a dear friend of mine. Uh, 
and it was, you know, uh, Shakespeare and the actor or something like that. And uh, so th those were kind of like my gateway drugs, you know, and then once I got to Iowa, it was just, you know, no turning back. So, so it's interesting, right? Because I, I, at least I think of writing as a kind of introverted or internal artistic yeah. uh, enterprise. Yeah. Um, but you had that track going on at the same time, you're also exploring this other outward facing craft. Or, and uh, yeah, that's a great just point. what drew you to that. No, oh, that's a great point, man. And I, I mean, don't you feel that whether it's directing or especially acting, right? Like when you have to repeat it in front of people, um, that when it's really sweet and when it's really singing, is when we've found a way to envelop ourselves in a sense of public solitude, right? Which is what Stanislavski talked about. But you know, mm -hmm. I think there's a way to live publicly on stage or on camera in an introverted way, if that makes any sense. Um, I think I think being the artistic director of a theater company for for too long. Um, <laughs> will force someone whose proclivity is more towards introversion into extroversion just by virtue of the job. I mean, you have to give a lot of speeches, you gotta, mm. you gotta do, do that part of the gig. Um, so I think at, at heart, I'm an introvert who learned how to be an extrovert. So let's just circle back to Iowa for a second. So you're on both these tracks. And so by the time you left Iowa, what did you think you, had in hand uh, in, uh, as an actor? What are the things you felt uh, strong about? What are the things you, you thought you knew something about and maybe you found you didn't know something about? Mm. I think I thought that there was, I think going there, I thought that there was like, you know, a finish line or, or some like secret room where if I would just read all the books and just learn all the knowledge that you know, that everyone else had privy to through acting classes and graduate programs, that then it, there would be kind of a sense of completion. And there was a class called Alternative Approaches to Acting taught by Dr. Eric Forsyth. And that class was what lit the fuse of the idea to start the gift, because that class was all informed by Eric's time with Jersey Kutowski. And so, you know, now we're getting a highly spiritual, highly sacred, true ensemble approach to not really doing theater, but making theater. And even before the making of the theater, a kind of uh, monastic ritual of training for the artist. Mm -hmm. And it, that seems so wild and intoxicating to me. Um, and so, I guess how, how the expectations slip was, I think I went from a young kid interested in, in end result to someone being, being at least ready to be okay with, with being lost and more fixated on process. And the first inception of the gift was called the gift theater project. I mean, the idea was that we would just train together and that's what we did for a year. Um, hmm. There was no, there was no thought of ever doing a production really. Um, and then it was only at the school at Steppenwolf in 2001, where I was like, you know, we could apply all this stuff to text and do a play. I was only at Iowa for two years, actually. My first year um, was a blur of doing every main stage show. And then to their credit, I guess, um, after my first year, the director of the theater program, Alan McVeigh, and a couple of professors had sat down with my parents and said, you know, we think, we think Mike might outgrow the program. And they kind of gave me three doors to choose. The first was to transfer to Princeton. The second was to transfer to Juilliard. The third was to stay at Iowa for year two. But, to, but if I tested into this program, to stay into um, stay at Iowa and do this program called Literature, Science, and the Arts, and what that was, it was uh, a way for me to take 
um, graduate and postgraduate level classes in kind of whatever I wanted. And then the idea was like, once you do that, fuck off, go to New York, Chicago, LA and see how you like it. And if you don't love it, come back and then you can be in a, whatever track you want to be in, you know, come be here for five years and get your MFA or whatever. So my second year as an undergraduate, I had no undergraduate classes. I was taking PhD level classes in James Joyce, Finnegan's Wake. Um, I was taking medieval philosophy. Um, and it was th that, that second year was the year, you know, where, uh, you know, I still feel, you know, insecure sometimes of not, of not graduating, but it was a hell of an education because it was getting professors from the writer's workshop. Then it was getting professors that I wouldn't have gotten until I was an MFA student. And um, it was a huge risk. You know, I'm an only child uh, besides my cousin. Uh, very few of us went to college. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dad's in there, Chicago cop, like, if you had a star quarterback, why would you tell them to go, you know, leave your school, right? Um, but, you know, those two, you know, uh, worlds aren't really transferable. And um, I think what I learned uh, simply by the act of leaving was being okay with starting to flex a muscle that was um, located in like the realm of risk taking, you know, mm. and being, being okay to work without a net and be like, this needs to work because there literally is no backup plan right now. And, you know, my, my first day, <laughs> and so you have all that, okay, here we go. And then, you know, my first thing is I'm, I'm wearing a tutu on stage at the Bailiwick in a 10 minute director's festival. And, uh, you know, my, <laughs> my, my dad and my family are like, okay, this is what we dropped out for. Okay. Got it. Fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, just being in the back of four moon tavern, you know, scouring perform ink with a red marker for what those auditions might be. And, uh, and sending out huge self-addressed stamped envelopes every week. I mean, it was just, it was a hustle, you know, it was a good experience of hustling your ass off. Mm -hmm. Things started to heat up around uh, 2000, 2001. That was School of Steppenwolf. I got my equity card at Northlight. Um, Can you just talk about what the School of Steppenwolf is just briefly? School of, School of Steppenwolf is a 10 week uh, training intensive, which was started by uh, Steppenwolf co-founder co -founder Jeff Perry. And um, Chicago theater, you know, uh, he hated being called a legend, uh, Sheldon Patinkin, who also was an uh, ensemble member of The Gift. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a 10 week training program for roughly 26 students, uh, hundreds apply each year. And Monday through Friday, they uh, go into a boot camp, really, of everything from uh, voice and movement, text analysis. Uh, I taught improv for about a decade there um, and scene, you know, scene study and uh, Feldenkrais and viewpoints uh, all culminating uh, in a, uh, uh, a bit of a pageant. At the end. It, it, was a, it was an indelible experience. I met some of my dearest friends and collaborators there. Um, and then I got sick. <laughs> so like I was, you know, things were moving, moving along. And then, uh, you know, I had my equity card doing a couple of shows and then, you know, out of the blue had a, had a spinal stroke. Well, let's talk about that just a little bit, uh, sure. for those who don't know you. Um, so a spinal stroke means what? A spinal stroke is a really weird idiopathic thing. It belongs on an episode of like Dr. House or you know, Chicago Med, I guess, these days. Um, it uh, is idiopathic, which means, you know, they can't really figure out why it happens. But, you know, within uh, an hour, I went from perfectly healthy 24-year-old to uh, a, a quadriplegic on a ventilator in a coma. Mm -hmm. And I was in a medically induced coma for a week. Um, I remember it. I remember the sound of the machine. I remember hearing voices in the room. Um, and then came out of it, was able to move all four limbs, 
got transferred downtown to what was the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. Now it's the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. And then about a week and a half into my stay there, it happened again. Oh. Um, and that one was worse than the second one because it didn't have the decency to put me out. Um, so it just felt like I was breathing through a coffee stirrer um, and was in hospital for, I think, four months. And then for about a year and a half after that was in outpatient for um, physical therapy, outpatient therapy, speech therapy. I had to learn how to breathe again, talk again. Um, and learned how to how to talk again on a collected anthology of David Sedaris's essays, which <laughs> to this day, you know, all respect to Mr. Sedaris, if I see it in a bookstore or on you know on, online, I'm like, no, get away from me. Um, but started doing uh, started doing Shakespeare soliloquies in the hospital to to build my stamina back up. And was that your idea? It was. Yeah. 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 And I believe if memory serves, we went to Steppenwolf. Um, and another theater, I can't remember, but they wanted me to be on stage in an, you know, to try to project to an audience. Mm. So, you know, my, my brain and spinal cord didn't know when my diaphragm would be empty. So I would just start a sentence with no oxygen and just, tip over you know um and you know it, i always get a little crunchy spending too much time on it but it, it would be disingenuous to say that it wasn't such a powerfully uh instructive moment in my life because at, at ric the adult floor was all occupied when i got transferred there for rehab and the only floor that they had a bed available was the pediatric ward. Hmm. And before I got sick, you know, I hated kids. They freaked me out. They pointed out my bad acne when I was a teenager. And I, in retrospect, you know, the, the kids really saved me because I would be working out in the, you know, the, the workout room with the physical therapist. They would be doing, you know, exhausting things. And then afterwards, you know, on this exercise mat, you would get sprayed down and they would start playing games. You know, they'd take out a tea set and some stuffed animals. And, and I started playing with them. I started improvising really. And uh, I think that's, you know, kind of where I learned that like, you can take, uh, you can turn an environment or an experience of, 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 of uh, of horror and sadness and turn it into a, a, a platform for play, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think that's, I, I'd like to think that's true in what I've been doing, um, especially with improv of taking fear and turning it into fuel. And, um, and I also think like, I think maybe as artists, like one of the, the central things we struggle with is like, do I really need to be doing this? It's a question I'm sure a lot of people are going through right now in the pandemic. You sure. Know, it's, it, this long emergency and this long pause of like, maybe I should be this instead. And what I remember really clearly was laying in the hospital bed after the second spinal stroke um, and saying to myself, like, you're going to have to fucking kill me before I stop acting. And, and like, no matter what it took, that was the purpose. Now, you know, whether that was just me creating a goal to, to work towards or not, to know that, to be very clear that, you can, you know, if you put a gun to my head today and said, you can never direct a play again, I would be, I would be sad, but it's survivable. Um, if you said you can never do an improv show, that would really, really, really hurt. Uh, or write, that would be bad. 
But if you said you can never act again, I'd just say, you know, just pull the trigger. So in spite of all of those other skill sets that you have, Michael, that still feels central for you. It does. I mean, and the pandemic's been a good lesson in how close writing still is to me. So I've been writing a 10 episode radio play for the gift. Um, and, you know, it's been, a, it's been a, a, a small fountain of joy in the early morning hours before, you know, reality comes crashing in. <laughs> but um, I think it's tough. I, 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 I don't know if it's 50, 50, but, um, but, but, you know, acting and writing are the two, the two uh, polarities. Uh, as they were at the beginning. Is now and ever shall be. World without <laughs> Amen. Amen. So as you're coming out of that rehab and building up your strength and building up your voice and uh, um, imagining a future for yourself as an actor, what sh shifts, if any, did you have to make in yourself in order, to, both on the practical side of getting work Right. Um, finding work that you could fit into um, or that you could convince people to imagine you fitting into. Right. Um, but I just wonder if, uh, uh, how, that, how that informed what came next for you. Well, it was scary. I mean, you, you sort of feel like you're living in a dream because you're going back to these places, whether it's, you know, your old home or um theaters that you used to go to a lot and now you can't navigate them uh at all or the same way mm -hmm. and so it feels like you just now have popped into a a parallel reality um and by that it, michael do you mean you can't navigate them physically exactly yeah yeah, yeah. just just in terms of physical barriers barriers for a wheelchair yeah. um and you know i I got back on stage in 2006 at The Gift, and it was two years of just emailing, sending things out, and the only theater besides the one I co-founded that reached out and was like, we're, we're going to find something for you. Uh, we love you, and we believe in you, and uh, you'll have a place with Steppenwolf, and they found... And that was Martha Levy and, and Erica Daniels. And they found the Elephant Man and then brought me back to, to direct there. And, but it was, it was hard. I mean, it was very hard. I, the, the person that I had been living with before I got sick left me. Um, I lost my apartment. I had to go back to my parents' house. And this career that was starting to go um, just disintegrated. Um, and I felt like a, a man with no country. And I think Sheldon Patinkin really saved me because he said, you know, you've done independent films before where you had to improvise. And, you know, I taught you improv at, at, uh, Steppenwolf, but you know, you've never really been trained in it. Like, why don't you just take a class at, at second city? And I'd won the Jeff award for doing this one person play at the gift, you know, and, and I thought, okay, well, I don't want to think this, this means anything. I mean, you have your, your, your fair share of, of, of accolades and, you know, um, I mean, and you know, there's no there, there at the end of the day, but you know, you don't, you don't want to, you know, um, get too, you know, you, you don't want to believe that that means really anything. Um, so he was like, do something that scares you, you know, you should do take an improv class. Uh, I was like, all right. So I took one class at second city called, um improv for actors taught by jack Bronis, who's such a great teacher and i was hooked because you know i was going through at that point daily panic attacks because the spinal strokes were idiopathic um you just feel like you're a question mark <laughs> uh mm -hmm. is this going to happen again and then the symptoms of getting when I got sick was a tightness in the neck, sweating, um, and shallow breathing. Well, it turns out when you have anxiety, you get muscle tightness in your neck, 
you get shallow breathing. So I was in a feedback loop. My brain was always mm. like, is this happening again? It's happening again, right? And um, so, you know, sometimes by the time afternoon would roll around, I'd be exhausted uh, just from that. In Willie Knows Middletown, one of the characters says, uh, panic attacks are the, the way they exercise these days. Um, <laughs> how they get their cardio. And then so I, I, I could show up to Second City and no matter how terrible of a morning I had or night before, I could go into an improv scene and I could be anybody, you know? Uh, I didn't have to be someone who uses a wheelchair. I could be a total asshole. I could say things that were true about my own life, but no one really knew that they were true because it was out of the guise of a character protected in the house of comedy. Um, uh -huh. And so I think I got, you know, I think Humpty Dumpty got put back together again in many ways uh, at Second City. So I stayed there after that one class, I auditioned for the conservatory, got into the conservatory, went to the conservatory, um, applied to the director program, went to the director program. So, but that, so that sense of risk-taking, that sense of play, that sense of that you could, um, there uh, again to trust to be whatever on stage and not being defined yeah. by being in the chair or how people might put a design around you yeah uh, i don't know is that putting words in your mouth it's not it's not putting my words in my mouth at all i i think it's it's um i mean if we really wanted to fast forward to the kind of secret at the bottom of the well you know uh, I think what it really was, was being willing to, uh, being, being willing to die, being okay with, from on a personal level of just what was going on with my medical history, you, you can't survive having a panic attack every day. It's no way to live. And so the only way to get rid of them is to not give a shit if they show up. Hmm. And, when, and when they show up, really genuinely daring them to get worse and say, do your worst. And they go away. And so I, and so I, think, I think that struggle, the physical struggle, the mental health struggle, all funneled towards a change in my acting, which was I was willing to go out on stage whether it was scripted or improv and truly live in a state of unknowing. Hmm. And because isn't that what we fear the most, right? A, a, a bad audition or a bad performance. It's a kind of death. You know, if our, if our identity is, is wrapped up and like, I am an actor, I am a director, I am a this. And then we get a bad review or the, the show just feels like off. It feels like death and it is a kind of death in a way. I was dying out there. I was dying out there, right? Um, or the or the arrogant corollary of that. I killed it out there. You know, it's always in, <laughs> it's always in terms of murder, you know. Um, but I mean, I think that's it. I think that is part of the large part of uh, of um, at least what makes it at least what makes acting uh feel sacred to me in a way that it in a way that i got a glimpse of as an 18 year old kid in iowa in that okay. class was that this is a this is an art form that helps people be okay with the most terrifying questions that have haunted our species since we first gathered around fires and made up stories to help orient ourselves between the heavens and the beasts and remind us who we are, who our tribe is, who we are not, who we ought to be, how we should conduct ourselves in a society. Uh, I mean, as you know, famously, the idea of democracy was so 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 nuts that they needed to bring the, the crazy theater people out to put on a play to illustrate the principles of it for the masses you know um and so i i just think they're they're kind of uh 
forever linked, you know, what the, the bullshit I had to go through health wise and, and the kind of art that I wanted to make anyway, you know? Hmm. That's extraordinary because yeah. it didn't have to go that way, Michael. No. Yeah. Martha Levy told me when you were in, you had this moment when you're directing a SYA, right? Where the Martha comes to give notes and it's just like, I had done, I had done elephant man there and we got, we got, we got out of that run. It was like, you know, temp, we were like waiting in the kitchen area and she's talking to the director and stage manager came out 15 minutes later and she's like, everybody can go home for the day. Like, okay. So when I was there to direct, I was like, shit, here we go. Here's my, here's my murder board, you know? And, uh, and, you know, luckily she, she had loved where we were in the play and thought we just needed a real dog. But what, what we spent our time talking about, she said, she goes, I know you're going to hate this. And I know that people and narratives aren't this, you know, binary and, and uh, clean cut, but don't you ever worry that you would have ended up a real huge asshole if you hadn't gotten sick? And <laughs> very few people could say that to me, you know, um, but I can see it. I can see it, mm. you know, buying your own bullshit, thinking that awards and good reviews mean something. And, um, I think I would have chased the thing, you know, and, and, and chased it down like a rabid dog, whether it was an award or, you know, a venue. And I think I would have been unprepared for the kind of crushing realization that comes with getting the thing that you're still you, you know, mm. like in the last year, I've worked a couple of years, I've worked with two Oscar winners and then a, two Tony award winners. They're still doubled up with nerves before the cameras roll or the lights come on. They're still second guessing themselves. They're, I mean, I think we sometimes think as younger artists or maybe not even younger artists, uh, there's, there's a there there, I'm gonna get to this place. And then, then, I, then I can be me. And it's like, no, I think, I think the actual secret is being okay and being imperfect. Right. You know, that's what we're often interested in seeing. Yeah. On stage. Uh, yeah. If we want it to look like us. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, of all the things people can do with their hard earned money and time, why pay to sit in the dark to watch someone be um, safe? And then I know safe has different connotations these days than when we started out, but safe in the sense that I mean, like, they're not surprised by anything. They're not really risking anything of themselves in telling the story. They're not, they're not confessing any part of their soul or, you know, their, their life really. They're performing and, you know, it doesn't cost them anything really. And, you know, that to me doesn't seem like a, a good experience, you know, and I think we can spend our time better. You were lucky enough before you had these events that you, you got to have your Steppenwolf training mm -hmm. and that experience. And you came out the other side of it and uh, challenged yourself, dared yourself to, to take a risk and, and investigating improv and that moved you forward. Um, how has your work grown since that time, and you've done a lot of directing work, mm -hmm. uh, Michael, and so, and, and maybe that has an influence on how you think about acting too, but I'm, I'm just curious how you feel like you've uh, been able to continue to grow as you mature as a person. I don't know if you find this as a director, but you know, I, I, your whole thing that you're trying to do, right, is like teach the kids how to, how to keep doing the thing without you, you know, mm -hmm. and then they get, then they get to the point where they can, and you're like, you're just betrayed by it. Like I just feel like heartbroken. I'm like, oh, you shouldn't have learned it that fast, you know? And I think, uh, I mean, I think I started directing to protect the gift. And I think I started directing to, because we were figuring out kind of what are we, who are we, what are we, what are we in, what's our aesthetic, you know? Um, and fell in love with, you know, just certain playwrights like David Rabe or Will Eno that, you know, I love directing and love collaborating with, you know, 
Um, I think directing, I mean, if you're a Chicago theater director, I think you, you learn this, just you have to, but I think, you know, directing forces, I think directing illuminates uh, the, how critical it is to know what your role is, right? How you serve the larger story mm. um, and how you can best be uh, an ensemble member, you know? Um, Sheldon used to get asked all the time, you know, what's the definition, you know, of a good ensemble and is an ensemble only as good as its weakest link. And he would always respond, no, an ensemble is only, only as good as how well it can compensate for its weakest link. And its weakest link can change from night to night or from scene to scene or moment to moment, you know? <laughs> and, so, and so I think a lot of times at the gift, you know, you're just like, I don't want to let my friends down. And I don't want to be that person that day. And so, you know, you learn um, how to serve that story. And I think, you know, in terms of how I've grown, uh, you know, I don't think it's a thing where it's like, do, 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 and some ups and downs. I think you kind of loop back and have to relearn some some mm -hmm. lessons all over again, you know? Um, I thought I defeated that I, problem, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, right, here we, here we are again, here we are again. Um, you know, one thing I, I learned, and I guess it's, and it's a luxury to be able to do it, but, you know, there was probably four years in a row where all the characters I was playing, um, Iago, uh, a, a world premiere in Maryland by Andrew Hinderocker, about a football player who gets paralyzed. Uh, a couple films, uh, TV character. They were all characters who hated themselves, mm. you know? And if you work a certain way and you're working personally and you're, you're, you're saying true things about yourself from behind a protective veneer of the character that's no one else's business and, um, and serves the story and isn't just you being emotionally indulgent, you know, it takes a toll, you know? And because our brains are incredible instruments, but they're also very dumb. And, you know, we go into a movie and we're like, we're going to watch a thing about aliens and we're going to love it. And our brain's like, you got it. And then I'll, I'll make you sweat. I'll make your heart pound, you know, um, just by the simple act of agreeing, you know, our body follows. And uh, I need to stop for a year and just take some time off and do some do do some easy TV um, and not and not <laughs> and not put my body and my mind through that ringer uh, every night and so that was one thing to learn and then and then the the show I started years ago you and me which is an improv show myself usually um, my partner is someone who's not really an improviser um, sometimes they're I hate the word civilian but they're someone who pulled a card uh from a deck you know and it's an hour-long improv show with this person wow and it's just one chair and that's been incredible um i just got to do that in dublin uh two summers ago before before the pandemic and i love that that to me feels like pure theater it also feels like every it feels like such a distillation and concentration of of all the things that i love you know the, the sacred and the spirituality the sacredness and the spirituality of the act of being together as human beings in a theater and how ancient of a ritual that is you know um and uh the catharsis the joy the laughter um getting to be ugly in public uh and uh talk about you know the dark things <laughs> Can I ask you just to circle back because you said something very um, quickly in in your answer um, when you were talking about the film work and other roles that took a toll on you. Um, you said something uh, if you work in a certain way, and I think I know what you mean by that. But mm -hmm. can you articulate what you mean by that? I mean, it's you know, it's the reason that the theater is called the gift. 
the quote that has the word the gift in it is from Grotowski. And uh, it says, you know, the actor in this special process of self penetration and self molding is be able is able to go beyond all normally acceptable limits. Um, and the actor gives a total gift to himself. And so, you know, what I mean working in this way is that it's um, you work from a personal place. You look at the character, what they're going through, and you see how that syncs up with stuff that you've gone through in your life, you are going through, you know? Um, and, uh, and beyond that, um, it's something I call kind of bring your ghosts to work. So that, you know, we were taught, we were taught early on in this class at Iowa to, to uh, dedicate a performance to somebody. Like if you're in a long run of a show and you're getting a little stale, to think about somebody who's had an influence on you and to kind of, you know, show up that Sunday afternoon for, for that person. Uh, and so um, I started dabbling in that specific kind of wizardry and um you know it it's it i mean it could be beautiful you know to to imagine that someone who never got to to see you perform because they passed away uh is sitting in the audience that day and it has a great way of just kind of clearing the cobwebs of all the bullshit whether it's camera trucks and you know lights being set up around you or if it's a somewhat more snoozy Sunday matinee crowd. Um, it gives you a great way to pierce through all that bullshit and remember that the only reason you're there in the first place is because people loved you and uh, supported you. And um, to make the decision to, to choose to imagine that they could be there and watch you um to me elevates everything um and opens you up in a in a way makes you a little more vulnerable and so you know when i blew past if you work that way you know if you do that for four years in a row you're going to be pretty pretty spent you know and and the, you know the the things those characters were dealing with you know a lot of it was self-hatred, abandonment. And so if these are issues that you as a human being have been working on, um, you, you have to be really careful as an actor because it becomes hard to discern whether in effect that well from which you're drawing your fuel is still full and you still have some personal work to do. Or if, you know, like a thief in the night while you sleep, you're going, your other self is kind of sneaking out and filling it back up so that you have things like from whence to draw to keep being artistic, <laughs> to keep being artistic, artistically, uh, you know, uh, 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 articulate, you know? And so that just becomes a really hard thing to parse, you know, and, and you just got to, be able to shut that down um, if it gets to be too much. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Sure. I have a, a maybe a more pedestrian question, but I, but I love pedestrian one, questions. <laughs> what um, what did you take from the theater to on camera work and vice versa? What how did those oh, serve each other? <laughs> I, you know, the gift was excellent training for camera work, um, accidentally so, but I because. mean, it's, because it's so intimate, it, because it's a 45 seat storefront theater, former shoe store, um, you know, most intimate equity theater in America. The stage is 22 feet wide by 11 feet deep. So okay. you're, you don't have to really sell it to the back row because the back row is 10 feet away. Um, and so, you know, in terms of scale of performance, 
uh, it was really good training for film because I wasn't showing up and just, you know, being too big. Um, and I think, you know, I find, I, I love film and film and TV work. And it's such a strange, weird, lonely monster, but it's the same principle, right? It, if I'm imagining that my grandfather uh, is getting to come see me do what I love and sit in the front row on open night when I'm nervous in a play, it's really no different with the camera. You're just, the camera's just a portal that you're sending your performance to a future person who's going to be on their couch or in a theater. And, and so you're performing for that person, you know, and it just has a great way again of, of distilling your focus and tuning out all the bullshit. Cause it's, there's just an endless amount of it, you know, um, no matter what you're doing, you know? Um, and there's a certain kind of, ballsiness to like things are shot twice and they're like and that's the scene <laughs> like, if you're a theater person you're like what are you talking about <laughs> you know like i remember <laughs> first episode of private practice like we did like two two uh you know uh you know what two takes of uh of a conversation and they're like all right turning around and did that and they're like all right that completes the scene i was like wait wait what what and there's no rehearsal no rehearsal you know, there's like people are in their robes reading the lines out the little weird scripts and then they go back to hair and makeup, but then we show up and we do it. And I think like that's that's insane to me as a theater person still. Um, but as an improviser, it makes sense. And so if I can marry the, those two um, and have my preparation cold and know my lines cold, obviously, and uh, know what I'm showing up for, then I can then I can roll, I can yield to the um, kind of endlessly uh, um, uh, creatively enervating environment that is a film or TV set, right? <laughs> I, li I like, though, again, how you gloss over very uh, trippingly on the tongue there. Um, you know, having done the preparation, having memorized the lines, <laughs> know what I'm there for, that's, that's no small feat. Right, as no. an actor to have that, no. to have all that in hand, to be able to be focused, to be able to be playful, to be able to be responsive yeah. in the moment. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, and I, and and that is important. I mean, your your specificity will be your guide. Your um, specificity is the pathway towards freedom. You know, discipline equals freedom. Um, and, you know, I was in, I was in uh, my hotel in Berlin about to shoot an episode for Counterpart, which is a TV show I was in love with um, that J.K. Simmons starred on. And my character like was someone who like loved J.K.'s character and hadn't seen him in a while. And he walks through the door and I'm just like, oh, what are you doing here, you know? And I'm, it's like the night before and I should be in bed. I'm like scribbling down like substitutions. Like, well, would, would this person work? Would this person work? Would this person work? You know, from, from my own life. And then I stopped and I was like, tomorrow morning, J.K. Simmons is going to walk through a door and talk to you. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's probably enough. Like, you could probably look at that. <laughs> That'll be exciting. <laughs> That'll be exciting. I think you got it. I think everything you need is going to be right there for that one. So, yeah, so, so sometimes you got it. Sometimes you have to substitute, and sometimes you don't. And um, that was that was one time I did not. So and just so substituting a person or an image from your own life or your own experience, that just to connect you to yeah. what your character might be experiencing in that moment, right? Right. Yeah. Or you know, if the given circumstances are you and your scene partner, or you know, best friends, or or whatnot, and you're just meeting your scene partner that day, and you know, you try to use what your what your point of view on them is in the moment. If that's not working, um, then you just kind of map uh, one of your close loved ones over them, and you know, you don't even need your scene partner. That's your takeaway from this entire conversation. You, know? <laughs> you don't even need your scene partner. Talk to someone who's not there. You know? This is terrific. Uh, 
conversation um and uh you are very much in the in the middle of your arc and part of what we learned part of what you've talked about is that the arc is not really arc shaped <laughs> no it's like it's like those old straws we drank out of when we were a kid the two loop-de-loops right yeah yeah, right. yeah. Uh, I look forward to seeing what all those future iterations are for you. Um, but I want to end with a game that I, I call it a game. It's just a series of questions with what okay, I call cool. three, two, one. Great. Three is uh, three actors whom you deeply admire and a quick reason why. Boy. It can be people that are really well known. It can be people that work in a small theater in Jefferson Park. Well, I can't do that. That just would get me into so much trouble. <laughs> I, mean, I, I can't even answer anybody in Chicago because I'll be in trouble for that. Um, I don't think it has to be. I think we also understand that it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, Audrey McDonald. How come? My senior partner. partner for two years. Um, watching her discipline, watching her ability as a Broadway star to scale a performance down for the camera, watching her be able to repeat emotion, take after take after take, when it wasn't even her scene, uh, her coverage. Um, a, I mean, she's a force of nature. I mean, no one's done what she's done in terms of winning like every Tony Award. <laughs> you can win for every category in acting. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, um, you know, a great cautionary tale of be mindful of the fire with which you play. Drew and, you to him, to his work. His vulnerability. Um, and, you know, Robert Schleifer, you know, Robert, Robert's a deaf, he's a deaf actor in Chicago. Um, and I did, a, I did one of my you and me improv shows with him and I try to see him and what he's doing. And, uh, we did our town together in Louisville. I, I think Robert's incredible. You know, I, 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 I hate the kind of articulated length why but you know as a deaf actor and an actor who's obviously speaking in asl what robert's able to communicate uh transports us all to a uh, all meaning those who don't speak asl um to a different experience like a non a metalingual experience hmm. uh where like images are crafted in a flash of, of fingers and um, it, it, you know, leave it, leave it to me, the guy in the wheelchair to talk about a deaf actor and, and I'm sure ableist terms, but um, I, I think what he does is he just, he weaves magic in a theater, mm. you know, and he's able, he's able to be so specific without words, you know, without spoken words. Um, Two, uh, a trick and a treat. And the trick is a, a trick of the trade. Well, the trick would be, um, whether it's a monologue or a scene, to read it and um, break it up into three acts. What you think are the beat changes, not necessarily what the playwright thinks, because we all know about playwrights. Um, but to you know what 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 you respond to is this is a shift for my character and then start at act three highlight that highlight that one color break it up script script analysis you know, look at the punctuation just attack it and then run that run act three until you have it cold then go to act two highlight that a different color break it up work on that so you have a cold, then run two and three together, two and three, two and three, two and three. Hmm. Then, go, then go to act one, same thing, get that cold, 
break it up at run at one and then one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. The reason is, and you've sat through how many thousands of hours of auditions, right? Actors are always great in the first 10 seconds. And then it tends to go like this, right? Mm. And I think what happens is like, it's like an X, Y graph. It's like the longer time elapses, the further away you're going, the farther away you're moving from what's more familiar. Cause we fuck up the beginnings. So we keep going back to the beginning to start over when we're working on a piece, right? Mm. Well, if you start at the end, every second that passes, you're actually getting closer and closer to home. The treat is something Sorry. that still gives you delight about acting. Mm. I, the pandemic has reinforced to me uh, how much I love and how much I miss a loud, messy house laugh. One in the three, two, one game is uh, one thing that you are still reaching for, um, aspiring to, or want to achieve? Well, I'd like to win an Oscar. That'd be fun. Um, when we talk about awards, I just think that would be a hoot. Knowing, um, of course, that awards don't mean anything. Knowing that, knowing that they're meaningless. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I want to win one because uh, it started as an April Fool's joke on Facebook and has since turned into a serious project that I've been researching for two years now, is I want to win one for playing FDR. Fantastic. That's uh, the best one uh, yet. Good. That's very concrete. It is very specific. You know? <laughs> it's specific. It has contradictions at the heart of it. It's just very me. You know, Michael, um, I just want to say, because we have uh, sort of lived in the same environment here in Chicago for a long time, but our paths have not crossed very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's been a real delight to get to know you and to not only that, but to sort of begin to understand the deep artistic convictions you have under what you do. Oh, um, it's inspiring. Oh, well, thanks. And th th thanks for asking me. It was fun to be able to talk about the stuff that I love.